Even as stay-at-home orders are easing nationwide, many of us are still struggling with the effects of isolation, as Lee Cowan now tells us. Baby birds, not quite ready to fly, stuck in their nests, waiting for their food to be delivered. That's pretty much the way so many of us have felt lately, even as we too poke our heads out more and more. We used to crave silence and solitude. Isolation was healing. But as beautiful as all of this looks, chances are most of us would trade peace for other people right about now. Human beings do not like to be alone. Jack Fong is a sociologist at Cal Poly Pomona. We're not taught to cope in solitude. We're taught to cope with people. We're taught to interact with people to get our validations. And when you're on your own, you have to author your own way out of this. And it's a very scary process. And that's really what this is all about, is coping, right? It Figuring is. out, like you said, we're sort of it is coping. figuring this out every day. We need to connect again to the body, to the handshake, to the hug. But for the time being, that's not gonna happen because our physical spaces have been emptied. And even as they fill up, we're still told to isolate six feet apart. Learning how to live in this kind of social straitjacket is kind of a, a new thing for us. Steve Cole is a genomics researcher at UCLA. He says loneliness isn't just a mental deficit, it can be a physical one too. We're literally more likely to die, more likely to get cancer, more likely to get heart attacks, more likely to get Alzheimer's disease, and more vulnerable to viral infections when we're lonely. Blame what he calls our dinosaur brain. Long ago, being alone meant being a pretty easy lunch for something bigger and more powerful. Our brains are wired, he says, to see isolation as a threat. And what happens when we feel lonely is that dinosaur brain immediately computes not safe, and it triggers these physiological responses that get us ready for injury completely without us thinking about it. So we may not even be aware of this. So even just being alone for a couple of weeks can have a, a physiological impact. Absolutely, even being alone for you know a few days is enough to do it. But isolation doesn't have to get the better of you. Just ask Father Angelus Echeverry. Do you ever get lonely? Oh, sure, sure. He's a Benedictine monk at St. Andrew's Abbey, on the edge of California's vast Mojave Desert. What would you tell people that are having a hard time with this sort of forced isolation, who haven't chosen this voluntarily like you? What would, yeah. What's your advice to how you get through it? Be gentle with yourself. Uh, be patient. Patience is something that is quite difficult to do because patience simply means to be able to sit with our suffering. Most of us struggle with that. But it's in that struggle, he says, that we sometimes forget that while isolation does take, it can also give. The space has been created for dreaming. The space has been created for allowing our mind to wander. You, you get know? rid of the clutter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not worried about the next thing because the next thing isn't happening. History is full of examples of people who have used isolation to their benefit. Henry David Thoreau, self-quarantined in these Massachusetts woods for two years, an experiment in what he called constructive solitude. It gave us his masterwork, Walden. In the plague-ridden 1600s, with playhouses closed, William Shakespeare penned King Lear, Macbeth, and Antony and Cleopatra. Sir Isaac Newton was stuck at home, too, when he developed the theory of gravity. All right, boys and girls, let me go to our slideshow for today. So today now let's face it, Newton, Shakespeare, or Thoreau what? didn't have this to worry about. I said what? Homeschooling. Or job loss, either, like most of us mere mortals. But if we can seize on our isolation as an opportunity, like they did. 75 rides on the Peloton. Even the smallest thing. And I've been making pot holders for the Might last empower us box. to feel a little yeah. less um, alone. So many of you have sent us the ways you've been coping with the lockdown, from sketching, to baking, to quilting. Carrie Fisher Pasquale has been typing her way out of isolation. You know, a lot of people are feeling robbed 
and they're feeling trapped right now. You yeah. know, they're, they're feeling so cut off, but there are certain things that you're never cut off from, you know, your spirit, your hope, um, your ability to encourage other people. She's making greeting cards using old photographs. She types uplifting captions on them like, better together, or your heart is my home. There's so many challenges, but somewhere in there, there is something that you can be doing. There is a gift in there. And if you can find it, I think that's complete joy. Nine-year-old Alex Nagorny found joy. It is called magic. And figuring out how to digitally disappear. Six-year-old Margot Rocchio discovered nature through a camera lens. The part I like about this quarantine, but I don't like to not be seeing my friends. And that, at the end of the day, is really how we all feel. We're all grieving the loss of community, even as we begin to step back out. I think once we resolve the physiological aspects of this pandemic, we're still going to have to deal with all the unresolved issues of new fears of the public. Isolation may linger just as long as the virus does. And while it is an unnatural human condition, our experience of being alone could just inspire a new way of living. All crises are opportunities to kind of go back to first principles, decide what really matters, readjust our lives, and lead a life that is fundamentally more nutritious for our, our spirits and souls. Tomorrow is not promised for any of us. And so what are we doing today? That's the question. How we live today is what will determine tomorrow.